Hi, my name is Lise Colucci, and as one of the life coaches at Queen Being, I am here to offer support while you discover, understand, and overcome narcissistic abuse in toxic relationships. Today's topic is the covert narcissist. The under the radar and sometimes extremely sneaky ways in which a covert narcissist uses to manipulate and control you. If that sounds interesting to you, hit subscribe and let's go. In talking with people about covert narcissists, one of the common themes that comes up is that they didn't see the abuse coming, that they felt it was a slow grooming that led from a perfectly loving relationship into one where they were being completely controlled and manipulated and abused without them even realizing that it was abuse. The covert narcissist doesn't use overt tactics. They use a quiet tactic or they use playing the victim or they, let me read some of the examples from what people have said to me. One person talks about how their narcissist did this to a point where it was ridiculous. He told me all kinds of things like his ex was bipolar and all the women he dealt with hurt him in some way. She felt sorry for him in the worst way. He's definitely a covert, a wolf in sheep's clothing. He also cried to her about how everyone leaves him, and now she knows why. They will often do this, where they play the victim and talk about how their exes are crazy and basically play to your empathy so that you sign an unwritten contract with them that you won't leave them. And by the very stating of how he cried that everyone left him, binds you through your empathy to that person to then not leave them. So you can see that it's a tricky manipulative tactic to get you to stay and to get you to give your empathy over to someone who doesn't have it to share in return. And someone says he surrounded himself with mental health professionals that are convinced he is abused and traumatized by, by them. Anytime they try to speak up, their side is not considered. So yeah, he's convinced mental health con professionals that she is the abuser. And I can tell you this person is not the abuser. They, they go on to say they're willing and open enough, but every time they have a conversation, he uses words like attacking, abusing, trapping to describe what they do. And it's an instant shutdown. So either he says something that instantly shuts her down, or he will just not say anything at all and zone out. So basically he's avoiding his own issues by making her the abuser and the attacker. Yeah. They'll turn a switch like this where anytime you bring anything up that is an issue with them that you need to talk about and you need to have worked through, they will turn it around to being you're attacking them, you're hurting them, you're abusing them by your simple questioning. So that is definitely the tactics of a covert narcissist. And someone else goes on to say, mine basically told me he would die of a broken heart because I didn't acknowledge that he was hurting too. What? Hurting too? With who? I'm sorry, we were talking about me and how I was hurt, but we couldn't because it was all about you. Yeah, it's turning the tables so that they then become the victim and don't have to deal with the issues at hand and don't even have to acknowledge that they've done anything to hurt. It's self-serving at its finest. Yes, it is self-serving at its finest. Exactly. Oh, here's a good one. I'm just a stupid guy. How am I supposed to know? I need someone to tell me these things. So he plays dumb. Yeah, he knows exactly what he's doing. He's just playing dumb so that he doesn't have to acknowledge what it is he's done. And the thing is, half the times, the things that they do aren't even that big of a deal. It's just a matter of catching them in something that you need to speak about. And they can't even acknowledge that. They can't accept it. They can't go into a normal conversation and discuss issues of a normal relationship. It all has to be flipped back and turned on to you. Oh, here's another, another mention of when trying to have a conversation with a covert narcissist and asking them anything about what they've done. This person says, the narcissist says, I don't understand the question. That's a surely a good way to shut down the conversation and make it all about something that it isn't. So, yeah. so those are some ways in which the narcissist will play the victim. And for a covert narcissist, that they have a really good, fast way of turning everything that you're saying to being, you're the one at fault. And it's so fast that when you're experiencing it, you almost might feel like it's your fault. Let's go on to some other 
ways in which the covert narcissist shows up. Someone says that their mom and their ex-boyfriend were both covert narcissists. They were so nice to everybody else, especially strangers, but when it came to our home life behind closed doors, it was hell on earth. The more you feed into their fantasy, the more they'll talk bad about you behind your back. They manipulate you, they gaslight you into believing they're perfect. And then they rely on talking ill of you to protect their false image. It took a long time to understand. They rely on your gullibility, your vulnerability, to feel powerful over you and in control of their own lives. That's a pretty good summary of what it's like to have a life with a narcissist who is a covert. This person says they were married to one for eight years and they've been trying to get divorced. So he was so outwardly caring with other women's problems. He was their go-to, but so uncaring and emotionless with me. He portrayed a perfect marriage to the public, but abused me in every way at home. If I tried to tell someone, even authorities, I wasn't believed because he had set up an image of the model citizen. That image that they create is where the covert hides behind. I mean, overts do it too, but the covert will have two different lives. They will look to be one thing on the outside to everybody else. And then when the mask comes off at home, and the abuse starts, it will be a completely different person. Sometimes there can be no yelling, no cussing, no cheating that you know of, no, nothing that seems like abuse until you break it down into the smaller components of what's actually happened meaning the manipulation and the mind control games are so subtle and so under the radar that it seeps in and gradually grooms you to believe that you have something wrong with you and that you're the cause of all the problems. This goes on to say they blame shift and, they, and it's so subtle and so swift that everything felt like it came back to them. And I mean everything. The victim stance was so strong in them so that every time I even had the slightest complaint or issue to talk about, it became me attacking them in their words. Basically, if you isolated about, if you isolated to momentary events, you could not explain the abuse to anyone. It was so subtle that even though I've experienced other narcs in the past, I did not see this one for, for many years. The grooming was so slow that it just became part of how it was. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It's what I was talking about with the slow and steady grooming and the subtle manipulations in the gaslighting, the projecting, that you, do, you just don't see it coming. And somebody else says they went through the same thing and they thought they were literally going crazy. I would know things for a fact, but he would turn the issue around to where I was in the wrong and feeling guilty for doing something wrong. But, but then they would lecture for hours on end to finish off with rough sex and they don't miss that at all. Yeah, then the lecturing starts. And they have to take the thing that they have proven through their gaslighting and drive it home with an entirely long and extremely wordy lecture, going over and over and over the facts that they see as facts or they're presenting as facts, so that you're completely convinced by the end of it that you've done something wrong. And if not, you're at least sort of talked and talked and talked and almost filibustered into accepting it or never getting any sleep that night. So the narcissist went out of his way to help people or at least told me countless stories of how he was the hero for someone, though he would never use the word hero to describe himself and would only then try to downplay the significance of what he'd done. Anyone would have done the same. It was no big deal. Because of this behavior and what little I knew about narcissism, I couldn't reconcile this seemingly good person with the evilness of a narcissist. Once I delved deeper into the types of narcs and their tactics, I began to see what I didn't before, that narcs can be nice and giving and supportive, all in quotes. They aren't all such obvious. Their evil is much more insidious and pervasive. I also realized that I had been groomed and programmed over time to, to not recognize the abuse and to excuse it. So when you're talking about all the good and the giving and supportive things, generally, if you look deeper, they are doing those things to serve self. They're doing those things to appear the hero. In other words, we all want to feel good by helping someone else. We all, most people, enjoy the feeling of giving to others. With a narcissist, they give to others so that they'll be seen in a certain way, so they'll receive the praise, which then gives back to themselves. A person who's not a narcissist, sure, that feels good once in a while, but for the most part, that's not why we do things. And by downplaying 
the praise and saying, oh, anyone would have done the same. It's sort of a passive aggressive method of getting you to continue to say, oh, no, no, you did such a great job. You're such a hero. Um, the, the need for being a hero is a huge red flag when it comes to looking for signs of a covert narcissist, at least in my opinion. They, not all heroes, of course, but there's something about the way it's done. There's something about the, there's something about the downplaying of it and the way it's downplayed. And there's something about the words they use to talk about the situation. Another person talks about how they recorded conversations once they realized that they were dealing with a narcissist. And as they learned about narcissism, which took a year or more, they were able to go back and listen to these interactions and pick out the manipulations. They saw gaslighting, stonewalling, triangulation, cognitive dissonance, etc. And they were able to notice the changes in tone with an intention. After about a year, they realized something. It was almost like everything that the narcissist said and did was a pre-recorded response. He said almost the same thing every single time based on her reactions, A, B, or C, which would trigger the next line. In the end, I stopped responding the same. His reaction started taking a full minute or longer, like I short-circuited the system. Super interesting. The final discard, I was able to defeat him and actually laugh at him. For me, this was a final moment. As I listen back to some of those recordings, I'm so proud of myself now. I was, crying I was a crying suicidal mess with no voice in the beginning, physically abused at times as well. And in the end, I was calm, clear-headed, and strong. Never even raised my voice. I can never use the recordings for anything but for my own therapy, and it was seriously saved me. And when I have a bad day and want to break no contact, I listen to the first one and then the last one, and instantly it kills the, de the desire to do so. It worked for me. Maybe it'll work for someone else. That's brilliant and a little risky because if you get caught doing that, then you can imagine the wrath that, and the narc rage that would or come at you. But extremely interesting it, that, that, that you saw those patterns of your response would trigger his response, would trigger your reaction, would trigger his reaction. So when we have a, a when we have a situation like that, basically, we will have a reaction to the narcissist based on our history, based on our traumas and our hurts and our reaction to them as well. But also if we have had them in the past and we have a pattern of traumatic abuse like this, we will have a reaction to gaslighting, say. And it won't be the reaction of someone who has never had that experience. Someone who's never had that experience might sit there baffled with their jaw hanging slack like what are you talking about but someone who has experienced gaslighting will go into an instant triggered reaction and the narcissist then feeds off that reaction and reacts back so basically you're never having a conversation all you're doing is having a battle of reactions one after the other after the other and that described it so well how you worded that and how that your reactions of a b or c would trigger the next line i love that and it well, it basically shows you you can't actually have a conversation with any depth with a narcissist, not with someone who's trying to manipulate you and someone who uses tactics to have a conversation. We don't need tactics to have a conversation. We can just have a conversation. So that is, that's a really great, I really like that comment. Thank you. And someone else mentions here, no one else except a handful of my family and closest friends will ever understand or be able to comprehend the under the radar methods he used to destroy every part of who I used to be. Even though I have people who are supportive of me personally, I feel some of them think I'm dramatic and have issues and I will never be able to get them to understand the true horror of what he did to me. This, his facade is intact and he gets to knowingly and systematically destroy someone else. And that hurts so damn much and I don't know that I'll ever get well again. You can get well again. You can heal from this and you can, you can do even better than you did before. And um, it just, it takes time and it's, it's work. And, but the under the radar that you mentioned is what I'm talking about here with the covert. They're, they do not appear, they do not appear conceited or arrogant. Oftentimes they're kind of introverted and quieter people. They, but not always. Sometimes they're very charismatic 
and but not in an overt narcissistic way in a friendly um heroic do-gooder way and you know when we go to look for what what to look for it's in it's in the intent because you can't know if someone else is a narcissist, of course, you, but you can look for their intent. You can ask questions about the situation. And when it is really tricky to talk about, someone explains is that I know he's covert, but I'm struggling to put into words how. Yeah, that's, it's really hard to describe because it is so under the radar and it is so sort of buried beneath the initial mask. So it's almost like there's layers of masks on these people. And she says, I justify his crap all the time. I just feel wrong with stuff he says and does. His view of women is off. His, ins his insinuations of being a, a whore aimed at me or women in general. His selfishness that is in constant small amounts. His lack of consideration for me as a person. His victimhood. His verbal jabs. Backhanded compliments. Complete disregard for his kids or myself. Seeing possessive behavior of his oldest son in the guise of care. He doesn't help at home except when he wants to. He doesn't do things that have to be done. That's my job. His silence, his words, his gestures. You just described it. Another description someone gave that I think is very fitting. It says, they're very good at shifting blame, very good at appearing good intention, very good at making up with me in front of others and giving me things and being attentive at first. Very good at making me feel faulty where I felt I had no choice for not doing things sometimes, like going with him to some coffee shop. He made a huge tantrum about it when no one was watching, but when they were, because I started crying out of how hurt I'd been felt, he held me and told me to stop crying because people were going to think he did something to me. He would cheat a lot. He would, make, he would always make me out to be irrational by seeming cool, calm, collected, and logical while I was so sensitive and crying and upset and hurt. Yes, they, they can stir things up to the point where you're almost hysterical and then sit there cool as a cucumber acting like nothing's wrong. Another person added a nice list. They said, here's a list that could possibly help some other people. You are not crazy. That did happen to you. And yes, that was abuse. You are right. That is hypercriticism dressed up as concern. Yes, they do understand. They just won't believe it because their egos, are, their egos are so fragile it would destroy them. Yes, that person is the golden child and they use them to make you feel worse about yourself. You are very worthy of every good thing. You are good enough. You are stronger than you know. You are not alone. I believe you and I believe in you. No, I cannot tell you what to do, but I am here to encourage you and support you on this journey. That's a beautiful list, and thank you. Um, it helps to hear those things when you're experiencing a narcissist in general and a covert narcissist in particular, because very few people see it and very few people believe you when they do see it or when they do hear about it. I never saw it coming because he acted humble, actually put himself down. He's more introverted, but definitely mean. He would give the silent treatment and then make passive aggressive jabs. Yeah, it, you don't see them coming. They're like snakes in the grass. You know, it's the wolf in sheep clothing, as someone else put it. Another person describes them as charming. Charming at work and with the family, always helping others, always knew more about his staff and their families than he knew about his own. He said he cared for his employees, but at home he was cold, distant, tapped out, and would drink. I felt like I did not exist, and he did not show empathy to me. He has a double life, I am realizing. He was involved with a subordinate, lost his job as a result, getting divorced too. Yeah, that, the repeating theme I'm hearing here is this outward appearance of being the good guy. Where an overt narcissist is pretty obvious in the attention they seek, the covert narcissist is sort of hides behind this good guy, charming or quiet or heroic or sometimes just average person mask underneath it all and at home and in private they systematically destroy you with all the same tactics any narcissist uses it's just you don't see it coming you don't expect it you don't expect what all of a sudden is selfish behavior from somebody who appears to be someone who gives to other people you don't expect it you, you, and 
it's so, so much that you don't expect that you think you're imagining it for quite a while. Another person talks about how the narcissist would create fights to then leave the situation. He would deliberately start arguments so he could use this as an excuse to disappear for hours or days. And this went on for many years with them. And, and then someone else says they figured out similar and the fights would be started so that he could disappear and have an excuse to go and do who knows what. Didn't see it till the end though. I never cheated on you when we were together. So he would use the we're not together right now as an excuse to go cheat. So yes, they can be, they can be very cunning at towing the line and then pushing the boundary. So they may not look like they are doing anything wrong because they make an excuse like, like this, like we're not, we weren't together then, so it's not cheating. But it's not just with cheating, it's with anything. They can, if they want their way, they're going to get their way and they manipulate their way into that way. And they can do so by creating an argument and making you the bad guy and them the victim so they have to storm off. They give a silent treatment in their pain and agony and their anguish from this argument and then go off and do whatever it is they wanted to do in the first place. But under the pretense that it's your fault that they did it. And the thing is with the slow grooming is that when you meet a person and they are all these great things where they're, you know, giving to people at work and they're heroic and they're, they seem to be nice guys on at least on some level and slowly, but surely they, begin the gaslighting and they begin projecting and manipulation, but it's all, it's all going on at the same time as heroic and good behavior toward other people is going on. So there you're seeing two different people in this one person. And it's really hard to know which one's real because if they're that good to everybody else and they're that good in the world, it must be me. If they're so good to everyone else and they're only bad to me, there must be something wrong with me. And, and it, it builds slowly. And when you get to that point, you're already lost in a trauma bond. And you are fully believing. You have full of cognitive dissonance. You know something's wrong, but can't put your finger on it. Or maybe you've put your finger on it, but you can't break your heart away from it. Because that other person is there also. That person that's doing good and, is, and everyone sees as the good guy. And that can take a while to break the spell of that and to see that they are not that good guy. That good guy is also a mask they're putting on. And how they treat you is equal or more important than the good deeds they're doing in this world or pretending to do or being perceived as doing. So I hope that that helps shine some light on on some of the ways covert narcissists can show up and behave. Some of the signs I'd say to watch for and red flags would be, um, you know, just people's intention. And we don't know intention of someone else, but we can watch over time. Getting involved too fast with someone the covert narcissist is going to get involved really fast because they don't want their mask to come off. They don't want to be seen until they know the person's hooked on them. So getting involved too fast doesn't allow you time to see the nature of someone's intent. And like I said, you can't know someone's intent, but you can certainly watch over time and see the things they talk about, the way they talk about it, the way it feels when they do talk about things they do, which are, seemingly heroic or good and see what it does for them. How is it feeding them to do these good deeds? What is it giving them? I mean, good deeds should feel good. They should feel great to give to other people, but doing so to serve self only is what you want to get at. You want to see if that's what's going on. Another red flag might be how do they respond to boundaries? How do they respond to being told no? How do they respond to having to wait for something? And are they playfully pushing your boundaries? Are they pushing your boundaries and making it seem playful and flirtatious? Those are red flags that, you know, shouldn't be crossed once you've had a narcissist in your life. Um, Somebody has to respect your boundaries. They have to understand that when I say, no, I'm not available right now, that means I'm not available right now. And that's it. And by pushing boundaries, you're in the very least showing that that person doesn't have the same emotional maturity that you're trying to reach in your own life. So whether or not they're a narcissist, it's certainly a red flag for behavior that could interfere with a good relationship later on. How they speak about their exes, how they speak about people 
and the, how they speak about the way people have treated them in the past. Are they the victim? If so, because I mean, as survivors, we have been the victim. So I mean, it's entirely possible that another person could be too. But if so, how did they talk about it? What was their healing like? How did they grow from it? What did they experience? I mean, most of us at a certain point realize we've grown a lot and we've learned a lot. And while we're not glad we had this experience, we realize the benefit it's had on our lives to heal and grow from it. A person that is going to stay in a victim mode in order to catch another person's attention is a giant red flag waving pretty fast right in your face. That's not, we don't need to save the world through trying to fix a toxic person. First of all, you can't do it. And second of all, it would, could kill you doing it. Besides the other red flags that could be true for any narcissist, but such as love bombing and giving too much attention straight, straight away, the attention is all on you. You're put on a pedestal. The conversation isn't about who you are. It's about the way you look and how you appear and how you make them feel. And, and I don't mean feeling wise, like you're really fun to be around, but in a way that, in a way that shows they don't have their own ability to have a fulfilling life without another person feeding them supply. And as you grow more towards your own fulfilled life, where you can take care of your own emotional needs and not be relying on other people for external validation, you see it more and more. So at the same time as you're working on learning all the red flags of what to look for in a narcissist, you could be healing up your own gaps in yourself so that you become a person who is filled with self-love and is able to fulfill their own emotional needs at least to a point where they know they can be happy but you know you can be happy by yourself other things you can do are learn about your own patterns with what love means to you and what companionship and partnership mean to you and see where you are expecting the relationship to fill needs of your own rather than filling your own needs and then having a relationship. Thank you for watching. Again, my name is Lise Colucci and I'm one of the life coaches at Queen Bee. Hit subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.